Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. So last time on the Paladins of Chivalry website we included a contact form in our basic build so now we're just going in and editing that. So under the contact us bit just putting in a little bit of text telling them how that to submit via the form or to find us at the physical address and then having copied that in and edited it down to the correct format we can go over and edit the contact form itself. So we go over to the contact form which is set up fairly basically already, we edit it and we select the email that it needs to be linked to, put in the Paladins of Chivalry Events Team contact email, so any form they fill in here and then click send will go to that email address. And just change the title to name or organisation because of course it may be people contacting us to get involved in the reenactment group or it may be people who are contacting us to book our services in which case they may be an organisation. And then just pop down to the footer page, copy in the address, center it, put the hours which we're actually at the scout hall, so that's when people can physically come and visit us, and then change the contact on the right to include the phone number, which I'll put in at a later date when I actually remember what it is. And that is pretty much it. Our contact page is done, ready to go. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes but you never know you might want to do it for some other reason then head over to squarespace.com forward slash drakenafel you can get a free trial and once you're ready that little link will give you 10 percent off your first website or domain so thanks once again to squarespace for sponsoring the video and on with the main show Hello everyone, and welcome to another video from the library. This one's coming in to you from a slightly lower altitude because we're in the lower part of one of the little corners of the library where the German collection resides. So as you've probably seen from the video, we're going to be looking at recommended books to get you started for learning about the German Navy. But as you can probably see, well, there's this shelf, this shelf, this shelf, and this shelf. And this is just the German specific stuff, not the general stuff so at some point I'll go over general books for introductions but since we're going by themes of time period and shipping we're gonna just stick with purely German stuff for the minute and we're also going to be looking at just what you need for Germany in World War One because if I did Germany in World War One and World War Two either High Seas Fleet or Kaiserliche Marina and the Kriegsmarine well, this would be a very long video, we'd be here for quite a while. So, let's get started, shall we? First, we're going to look at some older books. Um, if you can get your hands on them, they are definitely worth having, um, mostly because of the extreme granular detail or the specific time period that they're looking at um, in terms of when they were written, as well as uh, the ships themselves. And that's all over here. So, let me fish these out. And some of these will cover World War II as well, but we're mostly looking at things from a World War I perspective. So firstly, we have this one, German Warships 1815-1945 by Eric Corona. Uh, this is Volume 1, Major Surface Vessels, and it has an accompanying Volume 2, U-Boats and Mine Warfare Vessels. Now, the reason this is really, really valuable is that it is incredibly comprehensive. So um, if we start off, I mean, this is obviously because it's covering the whole period. You've got um, battleships, so this I've just opened onto the Bismarck, so if we go back a little. So here we have the um, Bayern class, and you can see um, they've actually you've actually got recognition patterns, so you can see Bayern and then Württemberg and Saxon, had they been completed, what they would have looked like in comparison to Bayern and Baden. And uh, you've got the Koenigs, etc. And you know, it's each ship has a relatively brief propulsion history. Uh, propulsion. Each ship has a relatively brief history, but as with some of the other books you've seen, you'll have names, builders, dates built. Very usefully, it actually also has the cost in marks, whatever the form of uh, Deutschmark, Reichsmark, etc. they were using at the time. Dimensions crew complement, handling, notes on propulsion, armour, weaponry, etc, etc. Obviously all summaries, but given you're covering the entirety of the German Navy for over a century, that's not exactly surprising. And then, of course, U-boats um, as well. And this can be very, very handy, especially if you're trying to figure out... Put those back there. If you're trying to figure out what the early German destroyers are doing, because you have 
S numbers, V numbers, G numbers, T numbers, and when do they switch from one to the other? And you know, is the, because it's just going in sequential numbering, does you know, is S sixty six the same class as G ninety seven or something like that? I have no idea whether those two are actually actual whole numbers. I just kind of pull those out of thin air, but you get the general idea. And then similarly, you have this one, German Warships of World War I, the Royal Navy's official guide to capital ships, cruisers, destroyers, submarines, and small craft 1914 to 18, which is of course very much focused on World War I with uh, the Kaiserliche Marine, with an introduction from Norman Friedman, who's quite uh, happy with it. Um, and as it says in the at the uh, beginning, for the modern reader, the truly unique value lies in the comment and analysis that backs up the data. So this gives you an, a good idea of what the Royal Navy thought it was facing off against. Um, so if we open it here, you've got um, von der Tann. So we've opened up to German battle cruisers, and the that's plate ten. So that, and then we're going on to the Moltke class. And although obviously some of the data is not completely accurate because this is what the Royal Navy thought rather than what was actually the case. It does go actually into a lot of detail, which can be very, very useful. So how far does the armor belt extend, for instance? Are there armored hoods um, on gun turrets and so forth? Where are the communication systems? Does it have searchlights? If so, how many? These kind of bits of data you don't actually see in a lot of reference works. Is the steering gear electric, hydraulic, etc.? what are the coaling arrangements? Just going through through some of the stuff they have listed for Moltke is incredibly impressive. How many rounds per gun in all of the guns, not just the 11-inch guns, but the 5.9-inch guns and the uh, even smaller torpedo tubes and so forth. So very handy if you can get it. This version was published by Greenhill Books. So those are the older ones. Um, maybe out of print, maybe hard to get hold of, but as I said, um, hopefully, as you've seen with the previous one on the Japanese, prices and so forth, at least what they are in the UK at time of publishing, should be appearing on the screen. Now, what else can you find that's definitely recommended? And then bearing in mind, this is general, so I'm not going to be looking at uh, books about specific ships or specific individuals uh, for the most part, although there are plenty to be recommended there. Now, where's that one gone? Okay, so the next one, this one, you can definitely get plenty of copies of. Germany's High Seas Fleet in the First World War by Admiral Reinhard Scheer. Obviously knows a thing or two about what the High Seas Fleet was doing in World War One. Obviously it is from his perspective. So as with many survivors and veterans accounts, there is a degree of bias involved, but it's, it's still a very good account. And of course, it gives you an idea of what it was like to fight Jutland, for example, from the German perspective, as well as various other naval operations. So very definitely worth a pick up. Well, that went well, didn't it? Right, then coming back down here, possibly one of the best purchases I've ever made for Kaiserliche Marina books, German battle cruisers of World War I, their design, construction and operations by Gary Staff. Um, everything you wanted to know about German battle cruisers, particularly uh, when it comes to operations. There's some really nice photos as well, uh, but again, for example, this one's full and open on a page for Moltke, and actually, ironically enough, has um, come in with uh, the account about Jutland. So if I go back a few pages to where it starts, so it starts on page 91, it takes extracts from the ship's log, it then summarises what Molka and its squadron were doing, and then it goes through hit by hit the damage it's taken. So hit number one, there's obviously diagram showing where these hits came in as well. You can see here, this is hit two, hit three, some pictures where pictures are available. Um, so every single hit that Molka took, plus more extracts from the log, how much ammunition it used, if it fired torpedoes at all, what happened to its machinery, how the damage control ran, etc. You know, this is the kind, this is really good stuff. Um, for those of you who saw my Sadlitz video, a lot of the information about what happened to Sadlitz during the battle was taken from this book, as was linked in the description. 
Next along, another good book, The Kaiser's Battle Fleet, German capital ships 1871 to 1918 by Aiden, or Aiden, possibly Dodson. Um, and that includes the ironclads, which obviously were gone before World War I uh, broke out. It includes some of the armoured cruisers uh, and battle cruisers. It's not quite as fully detailed in individual ships' careers as Staff's book, but then they're of about the same thickness, and this has a lot more ground to cover. So, you know, but as a, as a starter with a good summary, definitely, definitely worth having. And one of the things that's really handy is at the back you have these pages, which hopefully you can see here. So you've got basic armour diagrams, their appearance during times. So this is Koenig William, one of the uh, earlier ironclads. So you've got your armour layout, machinery layout, etc. How it looked during different time periods and a basic summary of the, the main key details if you, if you want a technical summary. So again, definitely worth having. And more recently, there's an accompanying one, the Kaiser's Cruisers, which, you know, clues in the name, you know what it looks like, looks at. Um, this one has a little bit more detail, actually. The font size is a bit smaller, apart from anything else. Um, and it still has, at the back, the same kind of breakdown. So these are Wiesbaden, Brumer, and Second Königsberg classes. So I can definitely recommend those, and actually I'm going to put those two together over here. Another good one, although this is a bit of a contrast one, so maybe technically this should be in the general section, but I stuck it in the German section because, well, there's plenty of books written exclusively about British battle cruisers, but this one, British and German battle cruisers, their development and origin, whereas obviously um, Gary Staff's book is looking purely at Kaiserliche Marine battle cruisers, this kind of does the dueling banjo part, looking at how they both developed and therefore offering some nice contrast as to why certain developments were made on each side as the other built their own battle cruisers, um, and has a slightly different focus as well. So, so actually, some very nice maps as well, <laughs> which helps. So this is really, really good. Um, and as I say, this one obviously I can refer to for British stuff as well as German stuff. And if you want another good general history of the Imperial German Navy, and you don't want to read something that's quite the size of a phone book, this one by Nicholas Volt Volz, I think, uh, from Imperial Splendor to Interment, the German Navy in the First World War. As you can see, it's not the world's largest book, but um, is quite information dense. There's not really any pictures. There's a few picture plates, but it's largely text. But it's a pretty good summary of the overall history of the Kaiserliche Marine in the First World War. Now, there are a few other books that I would genuinely recommend if you can read them. However, a bunch of them are in German. So I'm not going to go over them here unless there are German viewers who would like a specific thing looking at me saying, well, these books are in German and I think they're pretty good for you to pick up specifically because obviously the majority of people who are watching an English language channel speak English and uh, my German is possible enough to understand most of what's going on. And again, translation software covers the rest. But as you can see, there's a whole load up here, um, a good chunk of which has covered World War II, but some of which cover World War One, And some of these books over in this shelf as well, such as this one, which I actually have two copies of uh, by Ernst Harshagen, I think, um, <laughs> U-Boote Wertwarts. Um, completely in German, and also really unhelpfully in Gothic font. Um, it, it's it's tough going to un, to actually read and understand it because yeah, it's as I say it's in German. I'm not fluent in German, I'm, but I've got passable reading of it. But the Gothic font really doesn't help. But um, it does actually contain some rather interesting information if you can get through that and. That, I think, is probably about it for the Kaiserliche Marine in terms of how to get started um, with them. The, if you want to know a few additional titles that can go into specifics, like um, Count Luckner and his raiding habits and so forth, well, as you can probably see, there are books like that on these shelves, but that's a probably a decent um, number of books to look at to get you started on the Kaiserliche Marine of World War I. Um, next time we do this, I'll probably do the Kriegsmarine of World War II, so we'll still be in this little corner, 
and then we might move on to the American section which is directly above us. So look out for that at some point in the future. Bye now. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.